Hi, in this tutorial, we're going to talk about Newton's first law, also known as the law of inertia. And this lesson will include the various physical phenomena that we can explain using Newton's first law. So first, we're going to start with this physics puzzler involving this meme that you've probably seen on social media. I'm not quite sure if it is staged or edited or what, but it looks legit. <laughs> but real or not, um, the point is this is possible in real life. And the question that I want you to think about is what might have caused the hunk of stone to lurch forward? Maybe by common knowledge, it looks realistic to us if we have experienced or seen something that is similar. However, how do you explain this in scientific terms? That's, that is my question. Okay, so you can write your answer on a piece of paper or just keep a mental note of your answer. So let's dive into the lesson by going back in time. <laughs> so we're now in a time machine. <laughs> just kidding. Um, of course, it's important to know the people behind Newton's first law and not just credit everything to Isaac Newton because early thoughts on motion actually dates back to as early as Aristotle's time. So Aristotle is a Greek philosopher and scientist who lived from 384 to 322 BC. And he was really busy thinking about what makes object move the, the way they did. And Aristotle had lots of thoughts about different subjects or different aspects of physics. However, in terms of the motion of objects, his popular notion is that force is required to maintain horizontal motion. Um, now, you might be wondering, Miss, where, where did he get that? Like, is it something that's experimental? Well, take note, um, despite the fact that Aristotle is a Greek philosopher and scientist, He's more like a philosopher than scientist because he mainly relied on intuition, logic, and just observing nature. And so he did some experiments, but specifically for this particular idea about motion, this is just mainly based on observation of nature. He didn't watch a soccer match, <laughs> as you can probably guess. But uh, however, he, obs he took observations of his environment and he noticed that it seems like it's always needed to like exert a force on something for it to keep its horizontal motion. Okay, And along with that, um, all moving bodies naturally come to rest. And of course, you could probably guess, these ideas were accepted for ages by so many people Aristotle was really respected during his time. He was popular for many thoughts and other contributions in various fields of knowledge. And of course, he has strong relations with the church, so his words had credibility. However, centuries have passed and there was this guy whose name was... Galileo! Yeah, we have Galileo Galilei, an Italian astronomer and mathematician who lived from 1564 to 1642. And he actually questioned the idea of Aristotle regarding the movement of objects, especially because it was not backed by experimental observations. And Galileo is highly experimental. He was actually called as the father of modern science because he's not the type who would just contribute an idea out of intuition. Rather, he performed experiments and he really backed everything up with concrete observations. And in Aristotle's work, he specifically did an experiment where he used inclined planes and balls. And in this particular setup that he did in one of his experiments, he had this ramp. So it, has, it is designed so that it has a downward slope and then a flat section in here. And then there's an upward incline. And what he did in here is that he released a ball on one side of the ramp, allowing it to roll. So it picks up momentum because of that. And then it rolls freely going along this ramp and then upward. And then he noticed that the ball just reached the same height that where it started. Apart from that, as part of his experiment, he had this ramp, which looked like this. So the downward ramp is of the same incline. And then there's this horizontal section and then an upward section. He also released another ball on one side, that, so it picks up momentum, and then it moves, moves on its own, and then reaches the same height where it started. And then he had another ramp, <laughs> similar to the previous one. So there's a downward slope, and then a horizontal part, and then there's also an upward incline. But this time, it's even less steep compared to the previous ones. And then he released a ball from one side, and then he allowed it to roll freely. And then again, it reached the same height, as its starting position. Now, these are the important points regarding this experiment. By the way, there are so many conclusions made out of this experiment, and what we're gonna focus on are specifically the ones that are related to Newton's first law of motion. So, 
what he specifically noticed is that the ball tends to slow down when the upward incline is really steep. But if you make it less steep, what happens is that it's actually hard for the ball to slow down and it tends to like move farther. So as you can notice, um, in terms of horizontal motion, the ball actually traveled a longer horizontal distance when the ramp is less steep compared to when the ramp is steeper, like in this case. And then what he did, he wondered, like, what if I have a ramp which is just continuously horizontal? Like, yes, I'm gonna make it, I'm gonna give it a downward slope so the ball can pick up momentum. But what if the rest is just horizontal like this? So at what point will the ball stop? Because he noticed that the ball could only reach certain points for the ones where there is an upward incline. But what if you make it just a flat um, ramp following the downward one that where the ball gets to pick up momentum? So he asked himself, like, will the ball continue moving forever or at what point will the ball stop? So you cannot really test the idea of forever, like, because if you want to know, like, will the ball keep moving forever? That's an interesting question, right? But how do you test the idea of forever? That would mean you, you're going to have to, like, construct an endless length of ramp. But <laughs> so what he, what Galileo did is he just did a thought experiment, meaning to say, just ima his imagination. And then he thought, if you have a ramp that looked like this, extended, like, infinitely, then the ball will not stop. It will continue moving forever because what is there to stop it? Like there's no upward incline that acts like a barrier and also allows gravity to actively pull the, the ball. So yeah, he thought that it would just continue moving forever unless it is acted upon by an external force, example, frictional force. Yeah, he accepted that uh, friction can stop a uh, ball from rolling in the absence of friction and any other external barrier or force, like this upward incline, for example, this ball should continue moving forever. So based on the results of his experiment, Galileo concluded that objects moving in a straight line at a constant speed requires no force to keep them moving. And then he also stated that objects will continue moving unless an external force like friction, for example, or any barrier acts on them. Now take note, I'd like you to see that there is a glaring difference between the thoughts of Aristotle and Galileo Galilei. They are extremely uh, opposing each other. So according to Aristotle, force is required to maintain the horizontal motion of objects. In contrary to that, according to Galileo, it requires no force to keep something moving. Meaning to say, once you've set something in motion, like the ball in the inclined plane, it requires no force to keep it moving. And then also Aristotle said that all moving bodies naturally come to rest, meaning to say they naturally seek a state of rest. Even if you put them in motion, they will come to a stop. On the contrary, according to Galileo Galilei, especially due to the thought experiment regarding the last version of his ramp, objects will continue moving unless an external force acts on them. And that is because of his thought experiment where he thought, or where he realized this ball will not be stopped by anything, there's no barrier, and if you remove friction, it will continue moving along that horizontal path. Now here is the thing. You have to take note that Aristotle and Galileo had different backgrounds. Aristotle is also more on, more inclined on philosophy, logic, etc. And Galileo is more sciencey in nature. He did physics, astronomy. He also taught mathematics at the University of Pisa in Italy. And because of those backgrounds, um, Isaac Newton specifically favored Galileo's ideas more because if you look at Aristotle's work, he, he mainly relied on intuition and philosophical arguments. However, Galileo focused on scientific method, which Newton actually admired. It's based on observation, hypothesis, experimentation, and analysis. So what happened was that Galileo's ideas mainly serve as the basis of Newton's laws of motion. Of course, take note that we're not going to discredit Aristotle in this case because if it wasn't for those earlier misconceptions, then there would be nothing to like oppose or refute or test. So anything that is proposed, no matter how incorrect the idea is, those ideas, whether they're wrong or right, they still serve as a precursor for more modern scientists or modern thinkers to actually test if something is true or not. As for Sir Isaac Newton's work, he's an English polymath. He provided a more comprehensive and accurate understanding of motion and inertia than Aristotle or Galileo's views. And he actually did that by publishing his book called Principia, for short. It has a long title, but <laughs> you can just call that Principia. And in that particular work, he further elaborated on the experiments and observation that he did to further support the laws of motion. But aside from that, in his book Principia, he also formulated a mathematical framework regarding the planetary observations made by earlier astronomers with the help of what we call as the universal gravitation. 
So again, as I recall, these are the thoughts that were proposed by Galileo Galilei, and these serve as the main basis of Newton's laws of motion, specifically first law, which states that an object at rest remains at rest and an object in motion continues to move at constant velocity unless acted upon by an external force. Now, for us to fully understand Newton's first law, we need to like unlock some terms, uh, we have to define them. So example, when you say constant velocity, in case you've forgotten what it is, having constant velocity means not speeding up nor slowing down, and then not changing direction either, okay? Also, when you say inertia, it is the tendency of an object to resist changes in its state of motion. It uh, is actually derived from the Latin word inners, which means idle, sluggish, or inactive. Next thing we need to define is the concept of zero net force in physics because this is really important to like completely understand what the first law is really saying. So when you say zero net force, it's just a case where either no forces are acting or all the forces that are acting on an object are balanced. Example, so let's say this is an object. Let's say it's a book, for example. Of course, we know that gravity is acting on it. And maybe the force is 5 newtons and the negative sign for downward. And then as a reaction of the table to the book's weight, there is also a normal force that's also equal to the weight, which is also 5 newtons, but then it's upward, so it's positive. Now, in this case, you can consider here that the, there is zero net force acting on this particular object. And when the net force is zero, it means that acceleration is zero. But that is one of the points that the first law of motion is trying to say. When the net force on an object is zero, it will experience zero acceleration, meaning to say no change in its current state of rest or motion. So if the book is resting there, it will continue resting unless there is an, un an unbalanced force. But the forces are balanced, so there will be no change in its state of rest, okay? So another example of zero net force, but there are forces present. So in here, you have another object, and the weight of this object is negative 5 newtons, meaning to say gravity is pulling it downward at 5 newtons. And then, of course, there's no normal force when something is exerting its weight on, let's say, a surface, like maybe a table. Then the normal force would be 5 newtons as well, upward, because it's what keeps the object balanced uh, vertically. And then let's pretend that you are trying to, like, push this book towards a seatmate who's just like meters away from you in the same table in a library. So you're going to exert an applied force to do that, right? So again, imagine you're sliding a book towards a seatmate in a library. Okay, so applied force is 2 newtons in this case. And of course, there's going to be kinetic friction, right? Because of the irregularities and the surface of the table and the book, there will be some amount of kinetic friction. And let's say it's negative 2 newtons. If this is the case, where you are applying a force that is just equal to the magnitude of the kinetic friction, what will happen is that these forces will just sum up to zero because vertically, 5 newtons upward will cancel negative 5 newton downward and horizontally, positive 2 newtons or 2 newtons rightward will be canceled by negative 2 leftward, right? So in this case, there is also zero net force and there will be zero acceleration. What does it mean? If in this case, you are pushing this book towards a seatmate in the library, what will happen is that the book will not accelerate. The book will continue moving at the same speed at which you are able to make it move. So it's that simple, okay? So that's another case of zero net force. So take note, zero net force doesn't always mean that the object is at rest. Because in this case, you are exerting a force on something. You're applying a force on a book so you can push it towards your seatmate in the library, right? So that's two newtons to the right. However, there's frictional force, kinetic friction specifically, that is opposing the applied force that you're applying. So that will cancel the applied force. But if, if the book is already moving or if you've successfully overcome the static friction, it means that this book is already in motion. And what will happen when the forces are balanced is that the book will simply not accelerate, meaning to say, it will be pushed along the table at constant velocity, meaning to say it will maintain the same direction and speed towards your classmate. So that's it. So again, zero net force is not always at rest. Okay, it's either something will continue resting or something that's moving will continue moving at the same velocity. Another term we need to define is the concept of non-zero net force. So as opposed to zero net force, when you say non-zero net force, obviously the sum of the forces acting on an object is not equal to zero. So example, there is an object. Um, maybe it's a book again. <laughs> or any stuff you put on your desk. And let's say the weight of that object is negative 5 newtons. And then let's say, again, there's a table there. Just imagine. <laughs> and then, of course, the table will exert an upward force against the book or whatever object it is. 
that is equal to the book's weight, okay? So that's 5 newtons upward. That's what keeps the object stable vertically, right? It's just resting there, okay? Now, let's say you exert a force on it to try to make it move. However, there's a static friction and it is negative 2 newtons. So for you to overcome or, or to make this book accelerate from being at rest, you need to overcome negative 2 newtons. So you need to exert an applied force that is at least a little over negative 2 newtons. And let's say you get to apply a force of 3 newtons. So this is 3 newtons, this is 2 newtons. So what will happen if you add your horizontal forces, so 3 newtons plus negative 2, you're going to have a positive 1 newton. Newton force that is acting rightward, right? And what will happen is that the book will actually accelerate from rest, okay? So when in short, whenever you have a non-zero net force acting towards a specific direction, the object will be accelerating towards the direction of that net force. So this is a rightward net force, right? So meaning to say the excess force or the unbalanced force we have is pointing to the right. What will happen is that the, the object will accelerate rightward. So to clarify the Newton's first law using the points that we've made, take note that when an object is at rest, it will continue resting like this book on a table. But if it is in motion, like this book that you are sliding towards your friend, it will continue moving with a constant velocity unless there is a net external force acting on it. Let's say, for example, your classmate suddenly stops you from pushing the book. To summarize all those points, what it says is that when the forces acting on an object are balanced, the object stays at rest if it is initially at rest. But if the object is already in motion, what will happen is that the object will maintain the same velocity, meaning to say same speed and direction of motion, when the forces are balanced or when there is zero net force in other terms. On the other hand, when there is a non-zero net force or unbalanced forces acting on an object, something that is initially at rest will just start moving in the direction of the net force and something that is already moving or in motion will suddenly change its velocity, meaning to say it might slow down, speed up, or change its direction or even stop depending on where the net force is pointing and depending also on where it is initially moving. So that's it. It's that simple. So what the first law is basically telling us is that the only way you can change your life is to take action. Now going forward with the conceptual illustrations of Newton's first law, one example is for soccer. Of course, the soccer ball will just continue moving and follow a straight line path, as you know. However, the direction of the ball's motion can change when some of the players intercept with it, if they kick it in another direction, etc. And depending on how they kick the ball, of course, they can change the direction of its motion so it hits the goal. It can also go to the opposite side of the playing field and so on and so forth. So again, in the absence of net external force, an object in motion will continue following a straight line path. Of course, take note that even without the players intercepting, the soccer ball will eventually come to a stop even if it's following the straight line path because you have frictional force between the surface of the ground as well as the ball. And that's enough to like put the soccer ball at rest after seconds of moving. Next, another example. For ice hockey, it's really good that the playing area is in a skating rink because it's crucial that the hockey puck gets to travel a long distance before coming to a stop for them to fully enjoy the game. With ice, you, you get minimal frictional force and if you just hit the hockey puck, even at the slightest force, it can travel a long distance before getting stopped by a barrier or before it gets redirected by some other player. Next for this game, Angry Bird. Miss, you said um, an object at rest remains at rest and if it's in motion, it will continue with the same velocity, meaning to say same speed and direction. But how come the angry bird just follows that curved path? Of course, do not forget that there is gravitational force directed towards the core of the Earth. So if you launch the angry bird in an angle direction pointing upward or diagonally upward, then definitely the gravitational force is still going to pull it down. That's why eventually it follows a parabolic path, which is determined by gravity, of course. Now take note, uh, Miss, what if... What if there's no gravity at all? So what will happen? Without gravity, what will happen is that if you launch the angry bird like this, then it will follow that straight line path going up and it will not go back to the earth. It will leave you alone. <laughs> because, yeah, obviously without gravity, nothing will pull it down. And whatever you launch in a certain direction will just continue moving in the direction at which you launch it. So that's it. But of course, it's a theoretical scenario. In case you're wondering what will happen to these objects if, there's no gravity, then yeah, that's it if you launch it at that direction. <laughs> it will continue flying upward until you lose sight of it. So that's it for this. Then going forward, 
Okay, just a concept check. This could be a bit tricky, but it's because there's something that I haven't explained yet at this point. But by just using your, an educated guess, maybe you can try answering this. So imagine there is a bus and you're inside the bus. And then just for some reason, there's a random bottle like in the middle of the aisle. And you can see it. It's right beside you. There's just a savage, like, I mean, a parasite who don't know how to turn, um, dispose garbage properly. And so it's there. <laughs> So all of a sudden, you notice the bottle moves backward. So you might be wondering, Miss, is that a violation of Newton's first law? Because you said, when there's no net external force acting on something, it's not supposed to accelerate from rest or, yeah, it's not supposed to just change its state of rest or motion at all. So how come all of a sudden, this random bottle could just move backward? And I'm sure that no one kicked it. So is that a violation of Newton's first law? Well, quick answer. It's a no, but I'm gonna show you why. So imagine the same boss inside you, and this is your gorgeous face, and then, and then the bottle is here. So side view, originally it's just right beside you, so it's aligned with you, and then the bottle suddenly moves, quote unquote, moves backward. What's happening is this. I'll tell you. Okay, so that's the position of the bottle with respect to the earth. This is what's going on. Okay, so you see what's happening is that. It, it simply means that the bus is simply accelerating from being at rest, okay? So that's one possibility. The bus is moving from being at rest into a, a specific speed, whatever it is. And when that happens, what the bottle is actually doing is it's maintaining its state of rest with respect to the earth. So again, looking, at, looking back, this is the original position of the bottle with respect to the earth. Now, if the bus is moving... It's only the bus that's moving. And what will happen with the bottle, which can freely move along the surface of the bus, is it will just maintain its state of rest with respect to the earth. I mean, so that's it, meaning to say you're using the earth as a reference. Why are we not using the bus? Well, the, the thing that you need to know is that the bus is not considered as an inertial frame of reference because of its acceleration with respect to the earth. Newton's first law is valid only in certain frames of reference, and we call these frames as inertial frames of reference. When you say inertial reference frame, it is either at rest or moving at a constant velocity. Now take note that in the case of the bus earlier, it's actually accelerating suddenly from being at rest. So it's not moving at a constant velocity because the moment when you notice the anomalous behavior of the bottle, the bus was actually accelerating, meaning to say from rest, it actually comes to being in a state of motion. So that's acceleration. And when a body is accelerating, you cannot consider it as an inertial frame of reference and therefore Newton's first law is not valid in it. It, it will look like Newton's first law is, is being violated if you try to like analyze the bottle with the bus as your reference frame. So again, we cannot use an accelerating body as a reference frame if you are trying to apply Newton's first. Take note, the Earth is at least an approximately inertial frame of reference, but the bus in our example is not. Well, you can make the bus an inertial reference frame if the bus is at rest, okay? Because if it's at rest, then it could behave just like in the same way that the Earth is behaving. And you might argue, um, miss, the Earth is rotating, right? But take note that the effects of rotation on those objects, especially small objects like, you know, bottle, it is actually very negligible. So going forward, concept check, which of the following is an inertial frame of reference? So A, a car accelerating on the highway. B, a rotating merry-go-round. C, a spaceship moving at a constant velocity in deep space. D, a train decelerating to a stop. Okay, again, as a reminder, an inertial reference frame is something that is either at rest or moving at constant velocity. Also, there should be no rotation, whatever, right? So the correct answer here would be letter C. Why? Because letter A is accelerating on the highway. Letter B is rotating. So if a merry-go-round is rotating, you can't use it as an inertial reference frame, meaning to say Newton's first law will not be valid in there. And then a spaceship moving at constant velocity, that is an approximate inertial reference frame because it's moving at constant velocity. So Newton's first law will hold true if you analyze a situation that is happening in a spaceship in this particular state. And then lastly, letter D, decelerating. So meaning to say it's actually slowing down. So you cannot use it as an inertial reference frame because it can make Newton's first law seem as if it's wrong or it's being violated. Now take note, another possibility if the bottle moves backward, like in the case earlier, it's also possible that the bus it's not moving from being at rest it's also possible that the bus has been moving with the bottle and then the bus suddenly speeds up so example this is the earth this is the bus and then let's say for example initially 
the bottle is moving with the bus. They're at the same speed, meaning to say, after some time of like getting tossed around the bus, the bottle has now adjusted to the speed of the bus. So the bus and the bottle are, at move, are moving at 10 meters per second. So if that is the initial case, what will happen is that the bottle basically keeps up with the bus. They're both moving at 10 meters per second. However, what could possibly make the bottle move backward is when the velocity of the bus changes, especially when it speeds up. So say, for example, the velocity of the bus changes from 10 meters per second to 15 meters per second. Take note that when that happens, the bottle will still maintain the 10 meters per second velocity that it has, okay? Because the engine will only speed up the bus from 10 to 15 meters per second, but the bottle will be left with its original velocity, which is 10 meters per second. And when that happens, the scenario will look like this. So you see, the bottle is basically getting left behind, but why is that? So again, what will happen is that the bus will overtake the bottle and it will seem as if the bottle is rolling backward because the velocity of the bus has changed to 15 meters per second while the bottle is still moving at 10 meters per second. So that's another possibility when you see that a bottle or any other um, object is moving backward, okay? Also take note that we're only analyzing the linear motion of the bottle, so ignore your thoughts regarding the rotational motion of the bottle or the torque, for example, or rotational force that we call. So yeah, just think about the linear motion. Now going forward, here is another scenario. Like, What if you are, again, in a bus because you're like Dora the Explorer, you love exploring the world. <laughs> now there is this bottle again, another parasite through it, on the aisle of the bus. <laughs> but instead of being on the front area, like close to you, the, the bottle was like there at the back of the bus. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> the bottle moves towards where you are. So what does it mean? Uh, miss, does it mean that the bottle likes me? <laughs> do I smell too good? <laughs> or do I look like a trash bin? That's why this garbage approached me. <laughs> you might also be wondering, is this another violation of Newton's first law? Because no one kicked the bottle, miss. So why did it come towards me from being at the back section of the bus, right? What can make the bottle move like this? Forward, okay? So let's imagine that's the bus, that's the earth, and that is the bottle. If you look at the bottle, so yeah, it's at the back section of the bus. And then let's say with respect to the earth, it's in here. So how can this bottle seem as if it is moving forward to the front area of the vehicle? What's happening is this. Okay, in this case, when the bottle seems to be moving forward towards the front section of the bus, what's happening is that the vehicle is simply moving backward. I mean, that's just one possibility. The vehicle might be moving back from being at rest, okay? So if you look at this, because of the first law of motion, which is only valid in an inertial reference frame, we're going to use Earth as the reference frame. And since the bottle is positioned in here with respect to the Earth, what's happening when the bus moves backward the, the bottle of the ketchup is basically just maintaining its position with respect to the earth. But take note, it's not necessarily moving forward. It's just that the bus is moving backward and the ketchup and the bottle is simply maintaining its state of rest with respect to the earth. So again, it's not a violation of Newton's first law. It's just a matter of using the right reference frame when you are analyzing. So again, use the earth as your reference frame because something that is accelerating like the bus, it's, it's moving backward from being at rest. It's not an inertial reference frame. Therefore, Newton's first law will not hold true if you use the bus as a reference, okay? So that's it. There's another possibility if the bottle moves forward. So aside from the bus moving backward, making the bottle seem as if it is going forward, approaching you, another possibility is that the bus has been moving with the bottle. Example, um, the bottle has adjusted to the speed of the bus after getting tossed around for like quite some time. And let's say they're, they're both moving at 15 meters per second, the bus and the bottle. Okay, of course, if they're moving at the same speed, it will look like the bottle is steady, right? It's just chill inside the bus. So the bottle keeps up with the bus when they're at the same speed. However, when the velocity of the bus changes, for example, from 15 to 10 meters per second, so that's slowing down, what will happen is that the bottle will actually get ahead of the bus. Okay, so wh why does that happen? So the bottle overtakes the bus and it will seem like it is moving forward because what's happening is that the bottle is maintaining its original velocity, which is 15 meters per second, while the bus has slowed down. So basically, the bottle is just overtaking the bus. The bus has slowed down to 10 meters per second. The bottle is still at 15 meters per, se per second. Why? Of course, again, according to Newton's first law, this object will maintain at the same speed with respect to the earth 
which is 15 meters per second, unless there's an external force. And considering that there are no other forces acting on the bottle, well, friction could be minimal, right? It could be negligible. So what will happen is that it will overtake the bus, which has already slowed down. So that's it. It's not that the bottle wants to talk to you or something. It's just Newton's first law. You just need to use the right reference frame. And what the bottle is doing is it's maintaining the same velocity with respect to the Earth while the bus has already slowed down. So that's it. And then take note just a little application. You're familiar with seatbelts, definitely. Seatbelts, in fact, use the concept of Newton's first law to protect you because when a car suddenly stops, obviously, the engine only stops the car, right? The, the brakes could only control the car itself. But you, as someone who's just inside the car, your body will tend to continue moving forward with whatever is the speed of this car. Example, the car is moving at 20 meters per second. When the car stops because it hits a barrier, for example, or maybe someone hits the brake, then what will happen to you is you will continue moving at 20 meters per second due to your inertia. However, seat belts are used so that it can counteract this tendency to continue moving at the same speed that you had before the car stopped, okay? And that will prevent you from getting thrown forward because, of course, you don't want to fly out of a car. But, of course, more importantly, you don't want to fly like this, right? So that's the reason why you have to wear your seatbelts. So going back to our physics puzzler, what might have caused the hunk of stone to lurch forward? So simply, um, if the truck and the stone are moving at a certain speed prior to this incident, then let's say 10 meters per second to the left, um, when the vehicle stops, of course, the, the engine could only control the vehicle itself. Frictional force from the ground will only stop the truck itself. But of course, what will happen to the hunk? Due to, due to its great mass and with just minimal friction that can control it, then the hunk of stone will just continue moving at 10 meters per second leftward, barely deterred by friction. And like, just to demonstrate that, it kind of looks like this. So they're going together. When the truck stops, the stone still continues moving, eventually stopping because of this net external force provided by the front section of the truck. So that's it. So it's just first law of motion. That's why it's really dangerous to like have a setup like this. Ideally, there should be like anchor points in a vehicle like this, like a truck, so that they could tie a chain, a really strong chain that can somehow keep the hunk in a more stable position. And also, they, they, could, they could also use cradles. Those are like metal frameworks that can support the hunk of stone so it doesn't lurch forward when the car suddenly stops or when the truck suddenly stops. Another concept check for those who love banana ketchup. <laughs> Why do you think shaking the ketchup bottle help get the, check, the ketchup out of the bottle? So very simple concept. Of course, when you thrust the bottle downward, for example, then of course you're going to stop it abruptly, right? But when you stop the ketchup from being lurched downward, um, the contents will not stop moving. So they will continue moving downward and they come out of the bottle. So it's that simple. It's just law of inertia. Now that's a summary of the concepts. You may copy or write them down in your notes and then... That's all for this video, so I hope that you learned something. Thank you and have a great day.